Hello fleet and welcome back. With the recent arrival of the 3.1 patch and the introduction of the Japanese carriers, as well as the changes made to the USN carriers, it's time that we talk about the Japanese versus the American carriers. Now before I start however, I'd like to point out that this is merely my opinion and all things are subject to change in the subsequent patches, which I hope will actually happen because things as they are right now, pretty much a total mess. Anyways, so um, first personal thoughts about this patch, I don't like it. Um, for me, after patch 3.1 has come out, my enjoyment of carriers, which had existed all the way since the alpha test, is pretty much completely gone. Um, the main reason for this is my feeling that there is now this really strong attempt, or shall we say, by Wargaming to try to pigeonhole carriers into one specific role or another. In so many situations right now, it feels like that battles are predetermined way back while I'm in my port screen, and it's not even determined when I get into battle, it's just determined by what I choose to do back when I'm, my ship is in port. So, what I mean by this is that the choice of the flight control modules right now dictates in many situations on how the battle will actually go. Something that is not present on any other class of ship, in every other class of ship, how you choose to load out your ship in the port screen at most affects your own individual playstyle. It doesn't dramatically affect your chances of success when you get into an actual battle. So, okay, remember from now on, all the comparisons that I do assumes that the two players are of equal skill. Take for example, you know, right now, this particular carrier. This is my tier 8 Shokaku, and I've got it currently set up as a full bomber configuration. Now, if I take this full bomber loadout into battle, and I enter a battle without carriers on the other team, then it's total happy time for me. I'm just going to go around, and I'm just going to nuke everything from orbit. If I enter with the same loadout, and I run into another carrier that's also doing a full bomber loadout, then it becomes one of two things, either a damage race, or a race of who can get across the map as quickly as possible and obliterate the enemy carrier first. Now, that's not much fun when you're playing a carrier, because, you know, essentially, your battle could last just like a f like two minutes out of a 20 minute battle because you're just going to get killed. It's actually the reason why these days you're seeing how at the beginning of certain battles some of the carrier drivers are actually asking for truces with the other carrier and not to go bomb each other. It's just not conducive to good gameplay. Now if you were in a bomber configuration carrier and you ran into fighter configuration carriers then oh boy the entire battle is just going to be like suppressed. You're just going to feel like you're constantly being suppressed. And of course, if Matchmaker decides to mess with you, which it so often does, and puts you with two fighter configuration carriers, then you might as well just turn your ship into a gigantic battering ram because you're probably going to do more damage ramming other things than you are going to be able to accomplish with your bombers. Now, what about the other side? What about the USN carriers? Well, the USN carriers don't exactly have the best sort of thing going for them right now either. Let's take a look at the equivalent tier 8 American carrier, which is the Lexington. Well, let's assume that you're run running either the balanced or fighter setup on the Lexington. The problem with this setup is that, yes, you're going to be able to accomplish your job of clearing the skies of planes. Your problem is you have absolutely no hitting power. So, you know, with either two squadrons of dive bombers or one torpedo, one dive bomber squadrons, the most you're going to be able to do is either finish off a wounded target, which, mind you, if you run into like the higher tier American battleships with their god tier AA, you're not even going to break through that. So your, your options for attacking stuff become extremely limiting. Now, the Lexington does have a bomber configuration where it has one torpedo bomber squadrons and three dive bomber squadrons, but it's not going to be able to overcome the Shokaku's you know, bomber whoring. So if you run into a Shokaku battle and you're doing all bomber and they're doing all bomber, you're not going to be able to out DPS them. And you're also not going to be able to kill them on the first strike while they can kill you on a first strike. So there's definitely issues right now when it comes to the American carriers. Some people say, well, the Essex is better. Well, the Essex is a tier up. And while the Essex is capable of bomber whoring, and, you know, its fighter configuration is quite good. You have to actually think about comparing the Essex to an equivalent tier Japanese carrier, which is the Taiho. I would make a nice wager that if the Taiho were in-game right now, the Essex would not be able to out-bomber the Taiho. Um, so it's just something that I'm not happy with right now. It just feels like the, the carriers have lost 
all of their flexibility that they had before that they were able to you know task themselves to do different things now they feel like they're pigeonholed into one role and that's it that's like the only role they're good for so not too too happy with that well in terms of balance setups also there's only like if you look at the squadron mounts only the shokaku really has a like balanced setup where you have fighters bombers and you sort of have an equal number of all of them and it's with this particular module here um the here you have, i think has something very very similar um yeah two two twos the japanese carriers balanced setups are, are are on paper they're okay but in battle they're not that useful they're only really good against lower tier carriers so if you run into like the tier six or tier seven your fighters might be able to do something but if you run against an equivalent tier usn carriers fighters you might as well say goodbye to your fighters they're like paper get chewed up and spat out so quickly there's not much you can do so all in all what's the opinion right now well i think that right now carriers are seriously broken um they're not flexible enough they don't have the fun factor that they used to now they're just all pigeonholed into singular roles and that's not fun at all and i think that's one of the reasons why you know if you look at it, the numbers right now for players the carriers have such low player numbers because i just think a lot of people are just not enjoying these things anymore but enough of my opinions how about let's just take a look at the ships tier for tier and let's see how they compare now both nations tier 4 carriers which is the starting carriers are actually quite comparable with one another here is the japanese tier 4 carrier the hosho now the hosho has two flight control modifications that give it either one fighter squadron and two torpedo bomber squadrons or three torpedo bomber squadrons now do keep in mind that japanese squadrons are smaller with only four planes per squadron compared to the six for the u.s planes now the um flight control modules give it in essence either eight torpedo bombers or twelve the Hosho comes with a stock hull and an upgraded hull. The upgraded hull gives it a little bit more survivability, a few more AA guns, and a little bit more maneuverability. In terms of planes, the Japanese fighters are a little bit faster, but in all other regards are very similar to their US fighters. But don't engage US fighters head on because they have more planes and you will most likely lose that fight. In terms of torpedo bombers, the Japanese torpedo bombers are a touch bit slower and they are more fragile, and you do not get an upgrade with these at all. Now, um, the Hosho carries 24 planes and it stays the same for the stock and upgraded hulls. The Hosho's one main advantage over the American carrier is the fact that it's faster and it's more stealthy. Its maximum speed is 25 knots and its surface detectability is 7.9 kilometers. Its air detectability 8.1, but both these make this carrier quite stealthy. In contrast, the American Tier 4 carrier, the Langley, has vastly different stats. And we'll take a look at this in a second here. The Langley here has two flight control modifications as well. Its stock flight control modification gives it one fighter, one torpedo bomber, and its upgraded gives it two torpedo bomber squadrons. That means that in its stock one, it has six torpedo bombers, and with its upgrade, it has 12, which is identical to the Japanese carrier. But where the Langley um, obviously differs is in the hull. Once the Langley gets an upgraded hull, it can carry 30 planes in total, compared to only 24 for the Hosho. In terms of planes, the Langley is different in terms of fighters and bombers. Their fighters are slower, but there's more of them. So if you do engage a Japanese fighter squadron, you'll most likely win. The torpedo bombers are a little bit faster. They do identical damage, but they are more durable. Also, the uh, Langley's, I guess, biggest uh, drawback is its speed. It only goes 16 knots, which is painfully slow in game. Not only that, but its surface detectability range is kind of high. So if you are ever spotted by anything on the surface, like a destroyer or a cruiser or anything, good luck because you're never going to be able to outrun it and they will kill you quite easily because you'll never get unspotted. The Japanese carry, on the other hand, can actually, well, I mean, can run and at the same time its high stealth should allow it to hide a little bit. Tier 5 is where you begin to see the difference between the Japanese carriers and the American carriers. So here we're looking at the Tier 5 Japanese carrier, the Zuiho. Now the Zuiho has two flight control modifications, one that gives it a slightly balanced 1-2-1 setup, and it has a full bomber configuration which gives it a 0-3-1 setup, three torpedo bombers and one dive bomber squadron. Now this is in contrast to the American carriers which begin to focus more on fighters, and I'll show you that in a second here. The Zuiho has, uh, well, two, well, three hulls, a stock one and two upgraded hulls, and the final upgrade gives it a little bit more AA, a little bit more survivability, and a little bit more maneuverability. 
In terms of number of planes carried, it can carry 30 planes, which is an improvement over the Tier 4, and actually a little bit better than the equivalent Tier 5 American carrier, the Bogue. In terms of planes, the uh, Zuiho gets an upgraded fighter squadron. Once again, these fighters are faster than the American fighters at this tier, but with less planes, they probably won't survive that long in a dogfight with them unless you have them placed over some kind of anti-aircraft. The Japanese carriers do get the advantage in terms of dive bombers, as their uh, dive bombers at this particular tier, when upgraded, do more damage than the American dive bombers. Torpedo-wise, they have the stock ones and there are no upgrades, and these planes are a little bit better than the uh, Tier 4 planes, but otherwise they're, um, they do the same amount of damage, but they do have a little bit more survivability. Keeping the trend similar with earlier Japanese carriers at Tier 4, the Zuiho is nice and fast, going 28 knots, and has decent concealment, being able to be uh, detected on the surface at 8.5 kilometers, and has an air detectability range of 8 kilometers. Now, when contrasted this to the American Tier 5 carrier, I have to say that the Japanese Tier 5 is probably a little bit better. The American Tier 5, the Bogue, while it does have the ability now to effectively uh, mount an air, sort of a air dominance or fighter heavy setup with this flight control module that gives it two fighter squadrons, no torpedo bombers, and one dive bomber squadron, um, it does have its flaws. I mean, the Bogue is sort of like a Langley, just you know, one knot faster, and it still has this sort of really high surface detectability range, which makes it quite vulnerable if it's ever spotted. In terms of um, its hull, it's all of a sudden gotten a downgrade as its max unit uh, number of planes it can carry is down to 28, which is a bit strange considering it's a tier up. Um, aside from that, uh, the uh, the Bogue does have the ability to mount a bomber heavy setup, but it is one torpedo bombers and two dive bomber squadrons, which isn't really going to hurt that many ships at this particular tier, especially considering how the planes, uh, the dive bombers and the torpedo bombers don't exactly do the greatest damage. Where the American carry does have its advantage is in its fighters in terms of just having more planes per squadron and being probably able to out the Japanese ones because you have more squadrons. The problem does uh, present itself because these planes are a bit slower, so don't go around chasing the Japanese carrier's fighters, you won't catch them. But at the same time, if they do engage you, they will lose. The Japanese carriers at Tier 6 is the beginning of a time and a place where these Japanese carriers begin to get really scary when they're in their bomber configurations. So first of all, the Ryujo. The Ryujo has three flight control modifications. It's got the stock one, which gives it a 1 2 1. It's got an upgraded one that's giving it a 1 2 2. And then it has a purely bomber heavy one, which is a 0 3 2. Now, this 0 3 2 configuration makes the Ryujo truly scary because with three squadrons of torpedo bombers, and with these upgraded torpedo bombers that can now do a maximum of 8,500 damage with the torpedoes, the Ryujo is capable of starting to one-shot things with its waves of torpedoes. And pretty much, if you're playing a Japanese carrier, there is no reason not to use this particular setup, because even if you opt for the one that gives you one fighter um, squadron, you'll be absolutely useless when you confront the American fighter squadrons, because their fighters are pretty much going to rip you a new one. Now, the Ryujo's, the Ryujo's hull, excuse my pronunciation, wow, I can't speak tonight. The Ryujo's hull, uh, even upgraded, only gives a bit more survivability, a bit more AA, and a bit more maneuverability. Don't really get any increase in units, as you stay with only 48 planes in total. Now, when I was playing the Ryujo, um, I found that it was okay. I mean, it was decently fast, 128 knots, surface detectability is still really low. So this is sort of where you begin to understand that the Japanese carriers are really sort of offensive. You really have to sort of stick very, very close to the front lines, constantly get your you know, planes off. But again, this is why I don't like what they've done so far, is because this is pretty much the only role that the Japanese carriers are really good for. If you run into an American carrier that has fighters and you bring a fighter, you have just wasted your offensive potential for a plane squadron that will not be able to stack up against the American fighters. And I'll show you what I mean in a second here when I look at the U.S. ones. The American carriers at Tier 6 is um, you know, now the Independence, which has replaced the Saipan. The Independence has three flight control modifications. It's got this Mark 6 Mod 1, which gives you 111. It's got this fighter configuration that gives you 201, and it's got a bomber configuration which gives you 012. Now, both the stock and the upgraded uh, modules here uh, for the bomber configuration don't really have enough punch. But on the other hand, if you have the fighter configuration, you can shut down pretty much any Japanese carrier that is running, doesn't matter, any setup. 
but at the same time, if you're alone by yourself, you have no role. So again, the American carriers are a bit strange now because it's either you totally suppress a Japanese carrier, which it's not really fun for you because you don't get to attack anything except for planes. It's not fun for the Japanese carrier driver because they're constantly being suppressed. But if you, if you take this flight control modification and then you go into a battle where there is no carriers, what do you do? I mean, you're spending your entire battle throwing your one dive bomber squadron at stuff. It's just not much fun. But at least, I mean, the good thing about the independence is that, you know, for the first time since, well, yeah, for the last two tiers, you finally get a carry that can actually move. The independence is pretty fast. It can go 32 knots. And its surface detectability, while higher, I mean, at 10 kilometers, it's not exactly terrible. Plane-wise, the independence gets, yeah, pretty decent planes all around. Its torpedo bombers finally get to do damage if you decide to take it. Its dive bombers start to do decent damage. Its fighters are okay. I mean, they're American fighters. They will do their job. Uh, in terms of hull upgrades, you get a few more planes, a maximum of 37 units, with a slightly better amount of AA, maneuverability, survivability but you do lose your secondary armament, which hmm, could be a good thing. I mean, you know, you're not really supposed to be depending on those secondary guns to taking care of anything that gets close to you anyhow. So that's pretty much um, everything at tier six that, you know, is worth talking about. On to tier seven now. And finally, starting at tier seven, this is where the Japanese carriers pretty much take on one role and one role only, that being of the absolute bomber heavy setup because everything else is pretty much not viable and I'll explain why to you. So this is the Hiryu. Now the Hiryu has, um, well first of all it's got three flight control modules, it's got the uh, stock 122, it's got an upgraded 222, and it's got the all heavy bomber configuration of 033. Now the Hiryu carries 72 planes regardless of which hull it has, the upgraded one obviously does have a bit more AA and such. Now here's why you just pretty much go with the all bomber configuration because the Japanese fighters when upgraded only go 143 knots which are slower if you can believe it than the American fighters at this tier which means unlike in the previous tiers where your fighters can at least you know choose the time to engage by running away by tier 7 it can no longer do that because the American fighters are faster than yours so you might as well sort of just go for all offense and hope that when you do get a chance to hit stuff you can hit stuff and make them hurt. The here you is pretty fast going 34 knots. Um, its surface detectability range is still relatively low at this tier, only 11.9 kilometers on the surface. So that does allow you to get somewhat close. Do keep in mind though that Japanese anti-aircraft guns will always be a bit weaker, so your carrier will always be vulnerable to attacks from enemy carriers, especially other Japanese carriers. Now, in terms of the comparison to the American tier 7 carrier, which is the Ranger, and I'll show you why um, the fighters are pointless, Take a look at the Rangers fighters. When they are upgraded, they go 147 knots, and the Japanese ones only go 143. So that's guaranteed that if they decide to chase you with their fighters, you can't get away from them. <laughs> now the Ranger also has three flight control modifications, but like I've mentioned earlier, by this time, if you're playing an American carrier, you should probably be going with a fighter-heavy setup. You do have two dive bomber squadrons, but you know, you pretty much... I mean, dive bomber squadrons just still do not have that damage output. I mean, it's nice to set stuff on fire, so maybe just more map awareness, see where other ships are getting shot by HE rounds, when they burn, when they repair, and then just drop your bombs on them. That's pretty much the only way, really, to play the ship. I mean, the stock gives you, again, 111, which is kind of pointless, because you don't really have enough fighters to fully cover a hero use attack, and you really don't have enough offensive punch to really go hurt stuff. Bomber configuration, same thing. You're just not going to out DPS. A Japanese carrier. Now the Ranger's stock hull isn't very good as it only allows you to carry 58 planes but when you upgrade it it does carry more. It can carry up to 73 and of course American AA is well better so you're at least better able to defend yourself. In terms of torpedo bombers um, the Ranger's upgraded torpedo bombers now no longer have the same problem as they did before. They have had their damage fixed so now they do pretty decent damage but again you don't have enough of them to do that much um, hurt. The dive bombers, well, you know, they're okay. They do 5,400 maximum bomb damage, but, you know, the number of hits and everything, even if you use manual dive bombing, it's good, but never going to reach the damage potential of torpedo bombers. Aside from that, the Ranger has had a couple of other things fixed. It's a little bit faster now. It goes 30 knots max, but its surface detectability is really high, 14.2, which means you will be spotted and you'll probably get shot at by surface ships, so not one of those carriers that you would really like to get up close and personal with. 
And that pretty much repletes the trend at tier 8. I mean, we can go up and take a look at the Shokaku. The Shokaku being the tier 8 Japanese carrier. Again, same flight control modules as the Hiryu, but once again, the only viable one really is the all bomber configuration. I have tried the one that has mixed and I've, you know, set my fighters to be the ones with all the modules and upgrades and stuff, but not that viable as the fighters are extremely vulnerable to American fighters. They're useful against Japanese carriers or the carriers running pure bomber configurations, like and maybe an Essex running all bomber, but I mean, they just don't feel it. I, I don't feel how these planes can really have that big of an impact on the battle when compared to say an American carrier's fighters but I mean I'll show you that in a, in a second in battle as what happens when the uh, Japanese fighters engage the American ones but uh, the Shokaku I mean what's more to be said for this thing it's it's absolutely devastating when you're able to use its bombers correctly and you're able to hit stuff um, it does carry 72 max planes which means you do have plenty of reloads for your bombers but again I mean there are somewhat expendable but you know, not infinite, right? So you, your planes can still get shot down and you can still end the battle with very low numbers of planes. Uh, in terms of the fighters, bombers, and everything else, I mean, they're not bad. The dive bombers do quite a good amount of damage, 7,500 max. The torpedo bombers pretty much are stuck at 8,500 damage until at least, I think, the next tier, but we don't actually get to see that. And the fighter, I mean, we don't really use it. And these fighters, if you run up against the Lexington's fighters, they will get chewed to pieces. Speed-wise, it's pretty good, 34 knots. Surface detectability is quite nice at 12.4 kilometers. If you throw on the concealment module, it'll bring it down quite a little bit by about 10%, making you a little bit more stealthy and you can get closer to the front lines. But that's just pretty much all for the uh, Shokaku. I mean, I do have to mention that once again, Japanese AA is pretty weak, and if you run up against another Shokaku, like I mentioned earlier, it's who can kill each other fastest and earliest. So you always have to deal with that. And with the weak AA, you don't really get to defend yourself that well. The Lexington at this tier, as I've talked about at the beginning of the video, very similar to um, the previous Ranger. Um, it's got a little bit better in terms of the uh, the stock uh, flight control module as you now get a 2-1-1. So that at least gives you a little bit of offensive punch. American fighters, on the other hand, will chew through Japanese planes like they're not even there. Although the Japanese planes at this tier are a touch bit faster. So once again, you sort of get a choice. But if you do get into a fight, they will still beat you up. And heck, I tried it even over my own uh, ships with AA support. I still lost that fight. So... Not exactly that good. Aside from that, the American torpedo bombers do do more damage, which is nice, but again, you don't have those two squadrons. And having only six torpedoes at this tier doesn't really allow you to kill that many things because you do have to account for the fact that you will lose some planes on your attack run in, so expect to hit with maybe three torpedoes, maybe four if you're lucky, and that's not going to be as much damage to really be able to sink ma many of the capital ships in the game. Dive bombers, again, there's just not enough of them in the stock or um, or even the fighter configuration to do that much. Only the bomber configuration has the plane numbers, but the damage is insufficient. Now, the American carriers do go up to tier 9 with the Essex, and the Essex is currently the only US carrier that can actually effectively do a bomber configuration because it is a tier up on the Shokaku, and it has you know equal numbers of torpedoes, and it has more dive bombers per you know wave. So that makes the Essex the only carrier currently capable of, um, of bomber whoring. But again, uh, once sort of mentioned that earlier, if you compare it in the future to the Taiho that should come out for the Japanese at tier 9, then once again, I think the Essex will be relegated again to a fighter configuration role. And this is, again, something that I'm not too fond of with the current carriers. Alright, so enough of looking at ships in the port, because I'm pretty sure most of you can do this yourself. Let's take a look at a few battles, and let me show you some of these problems in an actual battle. So first up, um, I'm in a battle here in my Shokaku, and there's no enemy carrier on the other side. So pretty much in this particular battle, I have free reign to bomb whatever I feel like. And this is what I meant earlier by just being able to nuke whatever I want, really, from orbit. So here I'm taking a look at the battleships, and then there's an Azuma over here that's lost a little bit of health, and it's closer to the front lines. So I've got three squadrons of torpedo bombers, and I decide that that Azumo looks like a very nice juicy target. So, group my bombers together, and I will go and try and execute an attack. Now, as you can kind of see, just having A, especially just long range A, isn't really enough for me to lose many of my torpedo bombers. And it should be pretty easy to actually get uh, an attack on this target. And as you'll see, 
I line everything up, fire off my torpedoes, and I form a very nice little block. Now, Japanese torpedoes do travel nice and fast in the water, so you can fire them off from a little bit further away, and they'll still hit their targets. And I managed to pretty much wipe out the majority HP on that battleship, getting 10 hits. A little bit later on, um, and I'm looking at the map, and I'm seeing that there's a bit of a push that's coming down the 7-8 lines. So once again, I'm taking a look, and I see that there's a bit of a lone Iowa that's coming without much cruiser support and without another battleship really going along with it. So, once again, put my torpedoes bombers together, and then I'm going to go and attack this Iowa. Now, as I'm looking, I'm starting to notice that there are destroyers on my team that are starting to fire torpedoes towards these enemy battleships. Now, realizing that this Iowa is also in a position that's sort of head-on, and it will make it very, very hard for the destroyers to hit it. So I'm kind of hoping, and at this time I was like coordinating, that maybe what I'll do is I'll get into a position, I'll push the battleship so it turns, and at the same time while pushing it in a certain direction, the destroyer torpedoes will get there and hit it as well. So as you can see, as I'm starting to approach this Iowa from its side, it begins to turn. And as you can see, by turning it, it's starting to move into the position of the destroyer torpedoes. I still am able to get off an attack, although not as many torpedoes as the previous wave. I'm still able to get off a nice little block. This combined with the destroyer torpedo, and we were able to wipe out a full HP Iowa. However, once you run into another carrier that's got fighters, especially a USN carrier, well, the situation changes horribly, even if you have your own fighters. So in this particular case, I have two squadrons of four planes, and I see that there is a lone enemy fighter squadron that's coming. Of course, there was a second one, but I decided to engage and see what happens. Well, two of my squadrons engaged one squadron. The other enemy squadron actually decided to leave this fight alone and to chase my bombers. Take a look what's happening to my planes. Yeah, they're getting chewed up and spat out really quickly. And at the end of this, I actually lose both fighter squadrons. And the enemy fighter squadron still has three planes left. Not only that, but with this one remaining full HP squadrons able to chase my bombers all around the map, I had to fall back behind friendly cover. And this is just what I meant earlier by the IJN fighters are just absolutely useless when they run up against the USN fighters and having them is a bit of a waste, so why bother? And, you know, I have this experience and I've never run a balanced setup since, pretty much. The situation is made even worse when you happen to be in a Japanese carrier, you have all your bombers, and you run up against two USN carriers. And if they're both in their fighter configurations, you might as well just... I don't know, you might as well just either quit the game or just go ram the nearest ship you can find, because as you'll see here, I just get absolutely crushed. There is just nothing I can really do. At first, there's only two fighter squadrons that came. Soon enough, the Essex's fighter squadrons are going to join in, and once they do, like, total suppression is the only way I can describe this. I don't, you, you guys will see what happens in a second here. This is no fun. There is nothing I can do. My AA is useless against these fighters, and you'll see. Once they have five fighter squadrons over my head, my AA is going off. Hell, I even got a, a battleship, which I think was a Nagato at the time, that was lending me its AA. And just watch how many enemy fighters actually get shot down. It's like, nothing. They don't even feel it. And during that time, they were able to rip all of my squadrons pretty much from the skies. So, those dive bombers I sent off, uh, only one squadron was shot down because they tried to turn their attention back on my torpedo bombers. Soon as I realized that, I tried to get my torpedo bombers actually to land again, just to get a bomb the carrier, because if I left them up, they would all get chewed to pieces, but take a look, they're basically right over my head, my AA is going off. Yeah, how many planes are actually being lost by these fighter squadrons? Oh, there's one. Yep. One. That's just, yeah. And of course, if you, you know, remember the previous clip where I showed you how fast Japanese fighters would get chewed up, even if I had fighters here, they wouldn't have helped at all they would have just all died. My AA wouldn't have done anything. At the end of this, yeah, they pull away. I managed to shoot down two fighters. I think the battleship might have picked off one or two, but those fighter squadrons are healthy enough to just stick around and continue to stop me into the ground. So, fun, right? I mean, this is the state of carrier gameplay in patch 3.1. Depending what loadout you decided to run while you were in the port, 
and depending on which you know what matchmaker decides to put you up against, the battle is pretty much determined. You either stomp or you get stomped. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of middle ground that you can overcome with you know, skill. I mean, okay, skill does play a certain role. I mean, you can still get some damage in. As you can see, I did manage to finish off a ship and did get, like, did get one kill, but I've only managed two torpedo hits the entire game. You know, I did manage some bomb hits, but two torpedo hits. I mean, wow. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this anymore. And, yeah, I mean, let's just say that when they brought out 3.1 and they decided to patch things the way they did and they changed the carries the way they did I haven't enjoyed playing carriers since this patch and you know I've really struggled to make this particular video because I just wasn't having fun I just didn't have anything really positive to say about what happened to carriers I just didn't like the way they are I mean prior to this patch Carries were flexible, carries were adaptable, you can continuously, you know, play different ways to adapt to the changing strategies on the map, and all of a sudden, it's like, it doesn't happen anymore. So, you know, it took me a long time to try to actually make this and collect enough footage and just sort of force myself through it, and now you guys see what I mean. I don't like carriers, and I think the 3.1 patch has made carriers the worst class in the game to play. And I hope that with this video, and maybe if Wargaming decides to watch it, that they'll maybe uh, bring some changes about and make Carriers fun again. And that's all, folks, for this particular video on the Imperial Japanese Navy Carriers versus the USN Carriers. If you want sort of a final takeaway message, I would say for now, avoid playing these ships because they're not really that much fun. Perhaps wait to see what Wargaming decides to do with the future patches and maybe if they revert carriers sort of back into a way that carriers retain their roles that they had before, it will be better. Now, um, aside from all that, uh, just one more thing on my mind that I want to talk about. I really uh, do apologize that videos are coming out so much slower than they used to be. Um, I am extremely busy right now as it's the final months of the school year and I am a tutor and that is my day job and the majority of my students right now are trying to get good marks in their summatives and exams so I am very very busy right now I have uh, stayed up to about 4 o'clock in the morning right now trying to finish this video for all of you and getting it uploaded so yeah I do sincerely apologize for that but when the summer holidays kick in and my students take off then I will definitely be doing loads more videos Aside from all that, if you like what I'm doing, make sure you like and subscribe. If you got any questions, leave them in the comment section below. I know I've also kind of not really gotten back to people in the last video. I promise I will do that tomorrow. So until then, uh, have a great day and I'll see you all on the high seas soon.